in talking about the way in which propaganda, presentation, whatever you want to call it, um, is pervasive across the world. During the Cold War years, of course, it was symbolized by the way in which we subsidized the Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and the BBC to broadcast on the shortwave into the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe to win them over, so to speak, or to subvert communism. And they spent a fortune on trying to block these shortwave uh, radio broadcasts. Am I too loud or too soft? Or okay, right. Um, what I want to do now, though, this is all familiar. What I want to do now is to talk about a change in sensibility which bears heavily on what we're talking about in uh, Asia and the Pacific. And I'll try to explain what I mean. It's a pervasive change across much of the world. In the past, great powers preferred to be admired or feared. They uh, constantly boasted about their victories. They called cities after their victorious generals. Washington, after all, in the United States, Alexandria. Uh, in the 19th century, we called the railway stations in London um, uh, after they were opened. Waterloo after our land victory uh, against the French at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. We called our main square in the middle of London Trafalgar Square after our naval victory against the French in the same wars. So there was a pervasive tendency to boast about your power in the past and your strength and so on. This, I suggest to you, has changed. After the Second World War, we, and I think the Americans, but I'm open to objection from Steph, named none of our new um, airfields, um, uh, airports, after generals from the Second World War. We don't have a Montgomery Airfield or um, uh, any of the other things. And I don't think the Americans have a Patton Airfield or a Marshall Airfield uh, uh, um, station. You just don't do it. Uh, Steph's looking for thoughtful anyway. We shall see no, in a I few minutes. Right. I, think uh, right. I, I think there's a change in sensibility around the world. Partly, this is because we live in the age of the common man. The only um, airport in the UK which is named after a person in recent years is named after a popular singer, as far as I know. One of the so-called Beatles, uh, Liverpool Airport, changed its name to John Lennon Airport. This is very typical. In the 19th century, the uh, city governors would never have thought of naming uh, their new railway station after a, a, a music hall artist or something like this. We live in the age of the common man. So uh, let me illustrate it again in terms of commemoration. We have one day a year when we commemorate the Second World Wars. And this is not a commemoration of our victories. Uh, we, the leaders of government, the um, veterans from the World Wars and more recent ones, go to the centre of Whitehall and they mourn about the death, the dead from the Second World War. It's, it's a lamentation, it's not a, a pean of victory. Something has changed um, in sensibilities in the 20th century. It's due, as I say, to uh, politicization, the age of the common man, where ordinary people are involved in politics much more than they were in the past. It's also, to an extent, due to globalization. You want tourists to come to your country from abroad. You don't want to rub the noses of Japanese and Germans and French um, in their defeats in past conflicts. 
We want them uh, to enjoy their time in London and elsewhere and come back again, not to, not to have to um, uh, think about past things of that sort. Okay, you would think this is all a great success. We're, we're no longer boasting about that and so on. But we have chosen to boast about something else. Nations, or some nations now, boast about their past sufferings. And you can see this in a war, war inverted commas, a struggle which goes on in your part, uh, many struggles which go on in your part of the world. But notably in, of course, the one between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Because they tell uh, competitive narratives, separate narratives of victimization. The uh, Israelis talk about the Holocaust. They've, uh, they've got Holocaust museums spread across the world in Berlin and other places. They talk about the genocides against the attacks, the pogroms against the Jews over the centuries when they were dispersed in, in Europe. And they're addressing that and it's particularly successful in the United States of America. It's a narrative of victimization. And the Palestinians tell the story of their expulsion from Palestine uh, after the Second World War, and that is directed at uh, Middle East and to an extent against Europe. So you have a competitive narrative of victimization. Um, and this is uh, uh, very true across the area that we're going to we're talking about at the moment in Asia and so on. You get what one of the books calls history wars uh, 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 between the various countries. Forgive me for an anecdote, if if uh, if I may, uh, and this is a true one, and it's a tiny incident in history, long since forgotten. I was on the British delegation to the first UN special session on disarmament in New York at the UN in 1978. And in the middle of this uh, special session, the uh, Japanese ambassador got up and said, we should have a day of peace. There should be a world day of peace. And it should be on the anniversary of Hiroshima, the bombing of Hiroshima at the end of the Second World War. And immediately I registered problems. Problem, I could see this was going to cause endless trouble of one sort or another. So what you do in those sorts of conferences, if you don't like something that somebody is proposing and think it's going to be trouble, you what's called square bracket it. In other words, you say your government may not like the look of this. I had no authority back from London. Um, and I couldn't persuade my ambassador, Derek Ash, that this was going to cause trouble, that it might cause trouble at the political level, and that he should go to, back to London to see what London thought about it, because there was a danger it would go to ministers and they'd give trouble. Let me just illustrate what I'm talking about. In the area where we live, in Cambridge, all of us, there are masses of people around who were prisoners of the Japanese in the Second World War. They marched straight off the ships and into captivity. Churchill made a mess of uh, Singapore. It's an absolute shambles. And the uh, uh, local Cambridge regiment suffered particularly from this. They were used as slave labor in the Second World War, and half of them died. The Japanese plan was that all of these would be killed at the end of the Second World War if they were forced to surrender. We, we know this. Those who were um, uh, in Taiwan at that stage working in the copper mine, they could see that the explosives were laid at the entrance to the copper mine so that uh, they could all be entombed in the copper, the copper mine if uh, Japan were forced to surrender. So we knew this. They were saved by the dropping of the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so were uh, hundreds of thousands of Japanese lives because the Royal Air Force, the British Air Force, was just arriving in Asia at that time, hadn't been in Asia, and its uh, objective was to bomb beautiful old-fashioned Japanese cities made of wood and paper and so on, which burned horrifically under air attack. Had the war gone on, 
these attacks would have become much more pervasive. And already, the Americans had caused more casualties in Tokyo when Curtis LeMay, the head of the American Air Force, burnt out Tokyo, the, center, the whole of the center of Tokyo in one of these terrible firestorms. So what the Japanese were trying to do was, in one sense, to distort history or to give a particular view of that history. And they were trying to distract attention uh, from what they had done in China and elsewhere to make out, and they still do this, that they were the victims of the Second World War because of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Okay, well I hope you forgive me for a personal anecdote. Oh, and I should say, the whole problem was solved in the, in, in the end because the Americans went quietly to the uh, Japanese delegation uh, in uh, New York and they said, well, if you go on like this, I'm afraid we'll have to uh, propose Pearl Harbor Day for um, uh, World Peace Day. And the whole thing was dropped. Okay. So you've got these uh, competing narratives uh, uh, across the world. Let me talk more, a, a little bit more generally about uh, uh, the sorts of uh, propaganda nations make. Countries want to be liked. The Americans want to be seen as a light on a hill that, that, that all the countries in the world can follow. The Europeans today want to show how states want other areas of the world to see how they can follow the same pattern and confederate. All countries want to hide their failures and misdemeanors. Um, the Nazis tried to, uh, in the Second World War, to hide the mass murder of millions of Poles, Russians, Greeks, Jews, Gypsies, and others. It wasn't until um, uh, they were really exposed when uh, some of the uh, uh, concentration camps were discovered at the end of the war. As far as the Russians were concerned, during the course of the Second World War, they murdered tens of thousands of Polish uh, officers who'd fallen into their hands. And it wasn't until uh, Gorbachev was in power in the Soviet Union that they finally admitted to that. So uh, people, countries try to hide their uh, past misdemeanors. If they do come out into the open, then there's a tendency for countries to apologize for uh, their past uh, misdemeanors. Uh, democracies uh, uh, or Western democracies have apologized for their mistreatment of Aboriginal people in Australia, New Zealand, the United States and Canada. They have all apologized to their indigenous inhabitants for their mistreatment in the past. The British, have apologized, British governments have apologized for the slave trade, for the Irish famine in the 1840s, um, for the Amritsar massacre when Indians were shot down in Amritsar uh, uh, after the First World War, all sorts of things. One of the popes apologized over a hundred times to various people, um, including for the slave trade, for the Crusades, for all sorts of different things. Apologies are a response, and we'll come back to the question of apologies in the Japanese case, uh, to these history wars. Now, how does this fit in with uh, China? Well, first of all, as Steph illustrated this morning, this is all happening around the world, just at the time when the Chinese are becoming much more assertive. Uh, 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 and this doesn't play very well, as I'll illustrate, internationally. And at the same time, Chinese leaders are showing much more interest in engaging in intellectual debates and uh, with the outside world and to win uh, uh, friends outside their uh, borders than they've ever done in the past. They want to remind people of their quite reasonably, of their astonishing history, particularly of inventions. Um, uh, they were, after all, the inventors of printing, of, of paper, of gunpowder, of porcelain, of the compass, and a host of other technologies. Arguably, they, uh, 
Certainly in the past, they were more inventive than almost any other people. We know that uh, people uh, around the world have welcomed the growth of Chinese economic power. Who, after all, could not want to see millions of uh, Chinese escape from poverty? But we also know that despite all these efforts the Chinese are making to spread their culture, to win people over, um, uh, most peoples around the world have worried about the or, or are worried about the growth of Chinese military power. They may not understand the theory of the balance of power, but they fear changes in the balance, and they dislike any use of military power. Let me give you an a, a example which tells against ourselves. After the Anglo-American attack on Iraq in 2003, the majority of some uh, states allied to the United States in Britain, such as South Korea and Turkey, uh, the majority of people there said they were sorry that the Iraqis had not de defended themselves more effectively. It's uh, a salutary, sobering thought. According to the BBC World Service poll, uh, uh, published by uh, Gallup in Pakistan in 2014, China's popularity has fallen by a third <coughs> in recent years because of its military assertiveness. Similarly, because it's been caught in arguments with China over history and the ownership of islands, Japan, which in 2012 was the most popular country in the world, has also seen its popularity fall uh, across many countries. Well, of course, you may say opinion polls are all um, uh, to be taken with a pinch of salt. And certainly, uh, those of us living in Britain last year, uh, when uh, we held an election, uh, and most of the opinion polls got the likely outcome completely wrong, will uh, have a reasonable degree of scepticism about opinion polls. But, first of all, if we don't have opinion polls, we rely on anecdotes. And this was a, uh, very much true before opinion polls uh, became uh, established in the 1930s. Um, even uh, political leaders uh, relied on anecdotal evidence. We have no better evidence uh, than opinion polls. And the way in which Pew and other organizations now poll across the world give us a tremendous insight into what other people are thinking. Some of the polls, no doubt, are of course uh, better than others. Anyway, the changes in recent years in attitudes to China shows the difficulties Chinese face in uh, uh, winning over people and influencing people uh, at the same time as they're doing what uh, Steph was talking about uh, a little while ago. In the past, in the 1950s and 1960s, the communists uh, in power in China crushed internal dissent and ignored foreign views. Despite their control over the official domestic media, they're being uh, uh, forced, particularly by the web, to engage with public debates much more than they did in the past. They struggle to uh, deal with domestic criticisms of their policies through what's called Weibo on the web inside China. And the government responds by, to these criticisms which appear on the, uh, on the web in China by paying civil servants to post favorable me uh, messages on the web and sometimes by dismissing corrupt officials who become too unpopular. As far as prop foreign propaganda is concerned, they encourage sympathetic Chinese to hack into Western sites and post favorable messages while simultaneously blocking Western sites. But they're not always very good at handling 
um, uh, foreign media. Let me give you another anecdote, if I may, uh, to illustrate the point. Because anecdotes sometimes stick in people's minds better than, um, uh, better than statistics do. Last year, um, the other area where I live in England, which is called Hereford, has one um, or two uh, things of historical interest. And one of the things of historical interest it has is a copy of what we call in England Magna Carta. And Magna Carta um, it is the charter, as we see it, the beginning uh, of freedom in the Anglo-Saxon world. It was the first assertion of uh, uh, independence and the rule of law over, over the kings at that time. And because we had this copy of uh, Magna Carta in Hereford, and because it was the 800th anniversary last year of the signing of Magna Carta, they took it into their head to send it round the world to various different countries. Uh, one of the countries they decided to send it to was, for example, Malta. I don't know why they took it to Malta, but they took it to Malta. And the Maltese uh, considered that Magna Carta so important that they cleared the roads uh, across the island they provided a, a motorcycle escort and a helicopter escort uh, from the port to where Magna Carta was to be displayed. It was a, a considered a wonderful historical artifact. One of the other places they decided to send it to was China. And uh, when the Chinese, or the people or the intellectuals, whoever, discovered that this was going to, uh, going to come to China, um, it became clear that it was going to cause mass demonstrations. People were going to flock to see Magna Carta and look at it. So the authorities changed the site where it was to be displayed three or four times. They stopped all publicity about it as much as they possibly could. Um, but the local people, the young people, in the way that young people do, got round all this by telling uh, people on the web where it was going to be. And despite everything that the authorities could do, um, it, it caused uh, mass demonstrations or mass um, queues of people to come and, come and, and look at it um, uh, and to celebrate uh, liberty in a sense. And at the same time, uh, they banned uh, journalists from, go from going to look at this phenomenon. Well, that uh, foreign journalists, that's to say, well, this sort of thing doesn't play very well internationally. They, they do their best, if you like, to win friends and influence people, but they're not actually very good at it. Let me give you a few more illustrations of what they're trying to do to win friends and influence people. They have, um, uh, in Africa, for example, they've provided news from the China news agencies in Hua. They've uh, been broadcast from central China central television across the continent. They've set up an English language paper in Africa, the China Daily, uh, all sorts of efforts to do that. In the uh, developed world and elsewhere, they've set up Confucian institutes, cultural institutes, to um, propagate China's very considerable achievements in, cult in culture and technology. There are some 500 of these institutes funded across the world. Uh, as far as Britain is concerned, the universities of Glasgow, Manchester, Sheffield, London and Aberdeen all have Confucian institutes where uh, China uh, is spreading its culture. Now, what works against this? First of all, the factors that Steph was talking about this morning and also the way in which Chinese leaders often misunderstand uh, foreign peoples. And this is not something new in Chinese history. The Chinese are somehow, what we would say, is autistic in their relations with, or, or their governments are, are autistic 
in their relations with other people. Let me give you a couple of examples from history. It used to be thought that the Mongols were the aggressors against China uh, in what we call the Middle Ages, 500 odd years ago. Chinese historians now say that in fact it wasn't the Mongols who were very often who were the aggressors. In fact, what happens was that the uh, local Chinese governors were encouraged by the central government in China to cut off trade with the Mongols. Now, the Mongols were nomadic people uh, uh, outside China, and they desperately needed some items which only the Chinese could provide, such things as saddles and stirrups and food and so on. So when these were cut off, the position of the Mongols became absolutely desperate. And although uh, one of the local uh, governors uh, uh, said that uh, the Mongols should be treated like dogs, if they bark loudly, they should be beaten by, sti beaten by sticks. In fact, it was often the other way around, because the Mongols were good fighters, warrior people and because um, uh, they were desperate they often it was often the Chinese who were, who were beaten with sticks. Similarly in the 18th and 19th centuries they misunderstood uh, and, mis and underestimated the power of the aggressive Europeans. When the first British ambassador went to uh, Beijing he didn't know it but on his um, uh, cart that he was being taken to, uh, in which he was being taken to Beijing, there was a big placard saying, bearer of tribute from the barbarians. Now, this, this, whether this was true or not, this wasn't how the British saw their relationship with the Chinese. Yes, they very much admired Chinese uh, artifacts and culture. If you go to a, uh, an old country house in Britain, you will see it full of uh, Chinese porcelain in, imported in the 18th century. You will see the wallpaper is very often Chinese and so on. They admired Chinese culture, but they were in a, a very confident, aggressive mood at that stage, and they weren't um, prepared to be pushed around. And the consequence was, of course, the uh, British aggression against China from the eight, in the 1840s. Now, more recently, uh, as far as these history wars are concerned, they have, in my view, picked up, picked up historic argument with Japan, quite unnecessarily, from the point of view of foreign relations. Let me go back a bit. After the Second World War, you might have expected the Chinese to treat the Japanese prisoners whom they captured in 1945 very badly. You might have expected this uh, because the Japanese army had behaved extremely badly in China. I've written a lot about this and I've thought about it for years and years, but I, I still don't quite penetrate into it. But basically, what the Japanese had done in the first half of the 20th century was to create a warrior army. They thought or, or knew at that stage that Western military technology was likely to be better than theirs. So they had to create an army which was better man for man than the Western armies. And they did. The Japanese army in the Second World War, a warrior army, was man for man, Steph may dispute this, uh, uh, better than the British or American armies. They fought, they were told to never to surrender and to fight to the last man. So in Burma and elsewhere, you got situations where they simply went on fighting where they stood. Um, very few Japanese surrendered during the Second World War. It's an extraordinary uh, demonstration of uh, determination. Let me give you an illustration of what I mean. When we don't expect ordinary soldiers 
to be indomitably brave. If they are, we give them medals. We give them Victoria Crosses when they are particularly brave. Our, our general who was in charge, in my view, the best British general in the Second World War, Field Marshal Slim, uh, who was in charge in Burma, said that if the Japanese had awarded Victoria Crosses, they would have had to have given all their soldiers a Victoria Cross because of their determination and their, the way in which they wouldn't surrender. So they created this warrior army, but uh, the cost of it was that these people were brutalized in the course of their training. They were treated extremely badly by Japanese officers and they were allowed to victimize civilians in the area where they fought. So what happened? We talk a lot about Nanking, or Chinese novels talk about a lot of the Nanking massacre. Um, Nanking wasn't in any way unusual. There were massacres pervasively across Asia. Um, when they conquered Singapore from the British uh, in the end, at the end of 1941, beginning of 1942, they took uh, Chinese, for whatever reason, to create, I think, a reign of terror, down to the beach, Chinese men, women, and children, civilians, down to the beach in Singapore, they uh, tied their hands behind their backs, and they machine gunned them. And we know this absolutely definitely because uh, the, the bodies had to be buried or burnt by British prisoners of war. They didn't kill all the British prisoners of war in the same sort of way, but they certainly killed masses of Chinese. So that's a sort of diversion, I hope you'll excuse me. But you would have expected the, the Chinese, therefore, to treat Japanese prisoners of war very badly at the end of the Second World War. They didn't. They, both the Kuomintang and the Communists, treated the prisoners of war uh, relatively very well. They used Japanese technical experts that needed them to work the factories in China. And they wanted the prisoners of war to go back to Japan and to say uh, how um, uh, civilized the uh, Chinese were and how and to win them over either to the Kuomintang, the nationalists, or to the communist side. So it, it was a process of winning people over and they downplayed uh, the whole business of uh, Japanese atrocities inside China. <coughs> this has changed over the last 20 years. Over the last 20 years, they've gone on and on about Japanese atrocities. Why? Well, we think it's partly because they want to rally the Chinese people. Communist ideology, having failed, collapsed completely, now they have to increase Chinese nationalism uh, to the maximum extent. But they're doing this at the cost of their relationship with the Japanese. They've picked a historic war with the Japanese. And they say that the Japanese haven't apologized for what they have, what they've done. Actually, the Japanese have apologized, and they have apologized repeatedly for what happened in the Second World War. There's a very good book by an American analyst called Jane Yamazaki. I, I recommend it to you if you're interested in this subject. And she compares the apologies which the Japanese have produced, the emperor and others, uh, for what happened in the Second World War to the apologies which the Germans made uh, over the Holocaust and so on. And they're actually very, very, very similar. The Japanese have apologized, actually. Um, but the, the, the problem in Japan, <coughs> me, as opposed to Germany, is that um, the Japanese always then mess it up because they, they, their body language, so to speak, is wrong. First of all, there are groups in Japan which always dispute these apologies uh, and complain about them. Uh, one of the Japanese colleagues I've worked with and edited a couple of books, 
writes about their treatment of prisoners of war in the Second World War, and she gets constant threats uh, from ultra-nationalists in Japan. There are ultra-nationalists there who dispute this whole business of apologizing. The Japanese also make the mistake of qualifying the apology in ways that they don't have to do at all. Let me illustrate it by Prime Minister Abe's visit to Washington last year. Um, he uh, addressed both houses of Congress, as I recall, and he apologized. He said that the Japanese had caused um, immense suffering in Asia and to the Americans in the Second World War. Fine. But then he went to the un undermine the whole thing by a stupid claim that the Japanese had to expand at that period for economic reasons. They couldn't get the raw materials they needed in the Great Depression. Um, uh, and therefore they had to expand into Manchuria first of all and then into China and then into Southeast Asia. Well, I know that many of you are much better economists than I am. But this was in the middle of a recession, a huge worldwide recession. People were desperate to sell raw materials. They're absolutely desperate to sell raw materials. And in any case, it, uh, what he was claiming was actually wrong. The Japanese exports doubled during the Great Depression and so on. And as far as getting raw materials from Britain and the British Empire is concerned, the British were tied up in knots. Let me just explain this to you if I may, so I don't, I, uh, if I can get it right. India produced raw cotton. The Indians, because they were desperate to sell this cotton to anybody who would buy it, wanted to export it to Japan, where it would be manufactured uh, in their cotton industry and sold around the world and it would be sold more cheaply than we could produce it in Britain because the uh, yen was tied to the pound at a devalued rate. India owed a lot of money to the city of London and to the British government. So it needed to pay interest to London. The only way it could pay interest was to sell the raw cotton to Japan, okay? So, the British had to decide between Lancashire cotton industry and uh, the city of London and the Indian raw cotton exports. And what they did was to sacrifice the Lancashire cotton industry at that time. So once, once again, um, uh, it was simply false what Arbe was saying. It sets historians' uh, teeth on edge um, to hear that sort of thing and completely unnecessary as the whole argument over the Second World War is. Uh, basically, I'm very delighted that people across the world, as a historian, are interested in history. But I don't think they should use um, uh, 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 history as a weapon to beat their neighbors over the head. It, it, it's completely uh, counterproductive um, uh, in every single way. I'm going to cut what I'm saying uh, uh, short because I'm going on too long. The Chinese suffer it in other ways because as a non-democratic state, the obscurity of Chinese motives increases suspicions about their intentions. Apart from the South China Sea, we don't know what their long-run intentions are. China also suffers because of its domination of Tibet and its threats against Taiwan. Public opinion across the world usually favors small countries against large ones. And the, the, the Chinese uh, dominating uh, Tibet and persecuting the, the Taiwanese doesn't exactly play very well internationally. It present, China presents the West with a very different problem from the Soviet uh, pro, uh, challenge during the Second World War. As I said on a previous occasion, they don't present an ideological threat to the West. They have no uh, ideological pull, but they do present an economic threat 
uh, in the sense that they uh, uh, import raw materials from Africa and elsewhere, and therefore uh, these countries are to some extent dependent on them. Um, and that therefore maybe encourage the, uh, to support the Chinese point of view. And the Chinese have a very uh, clear example close at hand of the influence which money can bring to bear. Because Taiwan is recognized by about 20, 23 states across the world. Everybody else refuses to recognize that Taiwan is a state um, uh, internationally. And uh, uh, what, Taiwan, what the Taiwanese do is to bribe these countries into recognizing them. So such countries as Burkina Faso uh, and so on, and some of the countries in Central America uh, recognize Taipei. And what you've got across the world is a sort of competition in financial terms uh, between China and Taiwan to win countries over by the amount of aid that they can offer to them. So in sum, what am I trying to say? That the Chinese are trying to uh, deal with propaganda battles across the world, that very often that they're not very good at it because uh, despite all their efforts, uh, they're much too assertive that in the modern world, assertiveness doesn't win friends and influence people, rather it's, uh, it reduces your popularity uh, internationally, um, uh, and that they pick a fight with countries like Japan, which they've absolutely no, de uh, no reason uh, to do uh, in terms of international relations, whatever the situation may be like uh, in China itself. The West on its side will also have to respond more and more to win these battles, uh, these propaganda battles uh, with China, to argue the issue of maps, which Steph was talking about today. We have to show that uh, uh, history can't be used to distort uh, international law and to show that the uh, law of the sea uh, justifies the Western position over uh, the South China Sea and elsewhere. Let me stop there um, and uh, uh, break for uh, a few minutes and then we'll have a discussion later on. So a break, a few minutes. <coughs> I will apologize uh, for uh, the disruption. Uh, some of my colleagues uh, have been asked something very urgent, so uh, that's why uh, some of them are not looking forward to work.